activity sheet uh, at the top there and really kind of step through. I, it, it'll be a refresher for some of you, I'm sure. But for others, you know, it might inspire some new best practice or uh, instructional uh, strategies. So great, Jennifer, thank you for that. Joe, great idea, great idea. All right, I think I'm stable now. Okay, John, no comment to that, but are you ready to go? <laughs> Thanks, and ready to go. Okay, yes. we were just putting some ideas into the activity sheet. We've got a lot of activity there, as you can see, a lot of typing, uh, both both questions and suggestions. So I appreciate everybody putting on your thinking caps and, and getting some things out there. John, I'll hand it over to you, but if you continue to have technical trouble, uh, just ping me, I'm here. I very much appreciate that, Margaret. Thank you for jumping in um, as, as a volunteer here. And I want to introduce Morton Gernsbacher. Um, a lot of my evolution, I guess, in thinking about group projects is is based on um, some of the research and uh, collecting of, of research uh, that she has done. And so I want to invite uh, Morton you to jump in and and sort of summarize uh, some of the things that you've you've been um, finding out in, in your own investigations. Sure. Thanks, John. And hi, everyone. I'm Morton Ingrensbacher, and I'm a Bilas uh, research professor in psychology. And I recently wrote a chapter about group work uh, for a book on teaching of psychology uh, for high impact practices. And um, I reviewed a lot of the literature, some of which wasn't real, um, real positive in the sense that um, John has captured a lot of it in the activity sheet. But for example, that in general, students who otherwise would make high grades tend to make lower grades when they are graded on their group work and then vice versa for students who typically would make lower grades tend to make higher grades through um, group work grades than they typically would. And that students who are the more high achieving students tend to really dislike the group work. And um, I think we've all had those experiences in when we were um, students, uh, as well as in our workplace, and you know, John captured that uh, meme from The Hangover, and uh, which is the kind of the notion that many of us, when we're in group projects, we tend to um, have to pick up a lot of the slack, and others are not so responsible. So, what I drew from the literature, and there's quite a bit of it out there. And um, and I'm using the term group work in a very generic way. I know there's cooperative learning, there's um, other monikers, we'll say. Um, but anyway, what I grew, what I drew from that literature was that a good starting place is to um, talk about, think about building interaction, but not necessarily codependence. Or I, I called it dependence because codependence kind of has more of the psychiatric conception, at least in my field, but for other people, you might think of it as being kind of codependent. Um, and so that was kind of my my upshot. But I think this will be an exciting time for us to talk about how we can do that and, and map that forward to, as John has mentioned, easy and medium and then big, more challenging tasks. So. All right, great. Um, and I invite the folks on the call, folks in the in the in the session here to anyone who wants to unmute and and jump in with something that you'd like, you know, a burning question or a question or an experience that you've had that is wonderful or awful. Um, that would be wonderful uh, if you'd be willing to share that uh, unmute and share that with us. Um, and eventually uh, I'll invite you to again scroll through the activity sheet. We have some um, initial things to do. Um, I, I broke up uh, the activity sheet into sort of several stages uh, that we can do. And one of the big ones that we want to focus on again, as Morton was talking about, was um, protecting those initial trust building activities, right? If you think about any group that you've been in, um, unless you already know the group, it takes a while to figure out how to create a group that can trust and depend on each other. Um, and during a pandemic, having students who've never met each other thrown into a group and had to rely on each other 
with no training on that, no experience, none of that time or uh, experience to be able to do what uh, this group formation dynamics of of storming, storming and norming and performing. You might have heard of of that, and I, I'm blanking on the uh, the author of that of that. But in that initial group, it takes a while for us to get to know each other and for us to be able to say, okay, I know Cliff and I know what Cliff is good at, and I can trust Cliff to do X, Y, and Z. Right? Initially, I don't know Cliff, and so I don't trust him, and I won't trust that I can depend on him. So if we have to do work right away, then it's going to be sort of chaotic. So especially during those initial group project classes, um, projects and assignments, figure out ways to set it up so that we can all interact with each other, but we're not dependent on each other's work for the grade, right? So that might be something as simple as let's do an activity together that's not graded, we can sort of use it as a, a way to um, inform a reflection, and the reflection is what would be graded. So we've got some simple activities here below. We've got some um, easy, medium, uh, and challenging things. And for the challenging thing on the activity sheet here, um, we invite you to jump in and add to it below that if you've got a good um, but hard to implement um, thing that you figured out the secret sauce please feel free to jump in with that. Um, there are a couple of other ideas that we have. Honor the expertise. Uh, Crowley and Jake was talking about how we all bring something to the, um, to the mix, to the group, where we have specialties that nobody else knows. And when we have an opportunity to be the experts in the field and to bring something to that, on the one hand, we feel really, um, energized and motivated because we can bring something that we're passionate about, skills that we know that we're experts at, um, things that align with our values. So that's great. It also lets us sort of have the intellectual confidence to bring those forward to the other groups so, or others in the group so that others in the group can jump in and say, oh, I did not know that Courtney was an expert in that and they can learn from each other. They can learn from us, right? So are there ways that in those activities we can honor the expertise? Can we encourage them to risk and ex to explore, to take risks? Again, really great um, reason to have that low stakes um, initial group activity. Um, I think I've used the example of a sandcastle in here. If we build a sandcastle together and Morton's in charge of the moat and Courtney's in charge of the, the keep and I'm in charge of the battlements and, and Courtney says, oh, I want to make the keep, you know, five stories tall and made out of really thin sand and it collapses and it knocks over the battlements and it fills up the moat. Well, we're sunk if the sandcastle was the graded portion of the of, of the group project, right? But if learning about that and reflecting on don't build the keeps too tall or reinforce it this way, that's something that we can all take have our own takes on um, and report on that. And we're not dependent on sort of the cohesiveness of the group uh, and, the, and the right decisions that we made on that. Similarly, in, in fostering inter and intra group sharing, um, any time that we can see a group, somebody else's group project, it gives our group a chance to say, hey folks, we need to like step up because the bar is here. You know, we thought that we were at the bar here, but our bar here is actually really low, so maybe we should step up. As well as, huh, hey everybody, <laughs> we've been doing this wrong. We've got the wrong concept because everybody else has a different concept. We should revisit that concept. So it's a way of checking. It's a way of using that social learning and that peer learning to build in those self checks for each other. Um, and then scrolling down accountability. There will be times I know that you will have. Um, group projects where you will have dependence on each other um, and when that is necessary. Please build in opportunities for the students to be able to document and track what it is that they do so that they're not stuck with, huh, I did all the work and nobody else did any of the work and actually any of the other work that other people did brought me down. That has to be transparent to you as you grade that and it has to be transparent to the students so that they have a form of accountability for that and so that they're protected um, from the other students as well who might be not providing as much um, as, as they will. All right, so those are sort of the five 
five elements that we have, and now we've got some fantastic stuff to go through here. Um, and I want to quickly invite folks to unmute. You don't even have to raise your hand, but unmute and jump in if you've got something else to add about any of those, or if you've got a, a thought or suggestion that you want to add right away. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I had one, John. Um, was early on when you're presenting that idea of students having concerns about their grade, relying on others, and you know, kind of one of the foundation concerns of group work. And something that I have found, and I, I mean, I, I do the grade weighting activity through the team-based learning um, approach, where students actually get to participate as a class to help form. Well, if we know we have independent work and we know we have group work, they come together to decide, do we want it to be 60% weighted towards our group? Because we know that the group will perform likely 12% better than the individual. Or do I not trust my people? Do I not feel <laughs> good about the individuals in this class? Do we not have rapport? Do we not have a foundation? And I want 70 individual and 30 group. And I think that whether you embody that actual grade weighting process that's outlined in that resource or not, being transparent with students about the percent and the points it can ease them greatly and they'll focus on, oh, we're here to collaborate, we're here to build together, we're here to think and reflect. It's only five points, but you know, but for those students who really have that weight on them of like, oh God, they're gonna take me down or they're gonna affect my grade. And if you can really focus on what what are you what are you to learn in this activity and what is the main takeaway? Yes, it might be a low stakes activity, but that can I think that can help. And again, whether it's the percentage of activities in your class that in are individual versus group, or even just being like bringing the point assignment to the forefront, I think has alleviated a lot of concerns for my students. That's awesome. Courtney, I, 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 yeah, Courtney, I love that approach. And I have a question and then I have a comment. Um, the question is, does each team, and I know I appreciate it's team-based learning, does each team get to assign the weighting or does the, each, whole, or the whole class? class. Oh, okay. So we're because, embarking on that process right sure. now. Um, and we go through where, and actually it's amazing how efficient they come to it um, and how similar their requests are. Granted, my class size ranges between 30 to 40 roughly. So that is very manageable yeah. for a grade weighting activity. Um, but they break out into their individual groups. They come up with a initial proposal of I feel comfortable with 20 to 30 being individual and 60 to 70 being group. Mm -hmm. And then each group, like I'll put up on the screen, okay, group one said this is their range, group two said this is their range. And then we often just whittle it down and say, wow, look at the overlap. We're only 5% or 10% off. Mm -hmm. um, so then they go back to their groups again and they'll say, okay, you know, as a team, we're all right with that additional 5%. We'll, we'll budge on that, but we really don't want to go lower than X. And then they come back and usually with one to, th well, usually two to three reiterations of, okay, go back to your group and check in and come back. The entire class comes up with something that they feel comfortable with. Um, and I get really good feedback that it gives that they feel like they have some control, some ownership, some mm -hmm. trust. Um, and then it also helps with this, you know, they, they're, they've chosen the weighting of the group. So they come mm -hmm. into it knowing, they come in knowledgeable mm -hmm. right. about um, sure. what everybody needs yeah. to bring to the table. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think that you hit on two super important things. One is the control. And I think that, again, the literature suggests, and even in the, I mean, there's studies, even evaluating team-based learning, which I know has a lot of positives, but there are some aspects that, um, need some shaping, we'll say. Um, but I was going to say that um, you hit on, I think, two important things. One is the control issue, because I think that that, when I look through the literature, my sense is that that's what students 
are concerned about is that um, you're going to put me in this group. I know how to, con- I, I'm fine with being responsible for my own behavior, but now you're putting me in a situation where I don't have control over that. And I, d- I do want to burst the myth that it, what students are doing in a classroom in groups in many ways does not reflect the real world. We have a lot more control over our colleagues and we get to put into groups based on different principles. So I think that's one way to work around. But the other thing I wanted to to emphasize, I think is is um, excellent point, which is they're knowledgeable. And I would just encourage our colleagues that if you're going to be using primarily a group work based, be it team-based learning, collaborative learning, um, Play-Doh, the whole list, that you make that apparent to students during registration so that they know what they're getting into. Um, This now comes back to talking about issues of accommodation and access. And there are some students for whom even the most palatable group work requires a lot of accommodation. If they know in advance, this is a course that's going to be driven predominantly by group work, be it team-based learning or some of the others, they might make other choices during registration. And I'm just a huge, huge believer that um, we don't do as good a job at UW-Madison as many of our colleagues do in making our, in in transparency for access and making what student, what the course is going to be like available to students during registration. I mean, there are some universities in the UW system, in fact, that require all instructors to post their syllabi during registration, and we don't do that. There, the Ivy Leagues have a whole entire week dedicated for students to go and shop around and sit in the actual classes, look at the syllabi, and we don't do anything like that. So I definitely pick up on both of those things you mentioned, Courtney, which is having control and transparency. Great. Any it's validated here, by the students as well. One of the students from last year is my TA and she just said, I loved the grade weighting activity. I felt like we got control and that's exactly what she just said yesterday. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I, you know, I um, agree with you completely about transparency at the time of registration. And so what I what I did is I made a publicly available site for the course that is an ongoing site where I put the syllabus and introductory comments and explanation and course orientation module and how the course is organized in that publicly available module. And so um, I ran into somewhat of a problem with the administration because I I wanted to link (laughs) that publicly available Canvas site included in the timetable. But I, you know, I went all through the stages of stuff and eventually they decided they didn't want links in the timetable (laughs) that would, um, you know, be beneficial for students to make a choice. Do I want it, you know, enroll in this course or not? And so, you know, it, it, I, wow. I'm, I'm, I don't have a resolution, but, uh, you sure. know, this Peter, I'm surprised is, uh, by is, that. Yeah. I'm, uh, I, I, first of all, I applaud it, but I'm surprised because I put links to the entire course, the course syllabus, and the course contract in um, the quote timetable, I guess <clears throat> it's now called student center and faculty center for years and no one's ever complained. And I put it in the course notes and I require, I say before registering for this course, you must read through and I give the syllabus, agree to every item and I give the course contract and look through, you know, skim through and I give the, the course. So that sounds like something that, um, It would be great to work on as a, this is getting a little off of group work, but it would be great to work on as a um, instructional um, access uh, feature because I I agree with you completely. And if someone's saying, no, you can't do that. um, I, I know that some people are worried about quote, syllabus shopping, but the data are dramatic in showing that the more access that students have to information like the information you're trying to give, the 
shorter the time to graduation and the lower the ads and you know lower percentage of ads and drops, which makes all the sense in the world. So I can't imagine the administration wouldn't want those outcomes. Yeah, I was surprised, but you know, I consider it kind of like a a truth and advertising uh, issue. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, well, we can form a group. <laughs> on that. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If there are no other, and again, feel free to jump in. But if you uh, if there are no other uh, questions or ideas, oh, Scott, go ahead. Yep. Uh, so I had a little trouble getting into the meeting. I was able to get into this meeting, but I don't have access to this activity sheet. Oh, my apologies. We will paste that into um, the chat immediately. I saw. John? Yes. Okay. And I have a question in the activity sheet. There's um, the, one of the questions is managing bandwidth variables slash variable bandwidth. And I just wanted some clarification. Is that um, internet bandwidth? Is that what that question is? Or is it like student ability and energy and our own energy to be able to handle all of the group projects that we have to grade and manage and facilitate? Good question. What, 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 that, what is meant by that? I asked that question. Um, this is JT. I asked that question, so it, I guess it goes in both ways. <laughs> so however you choose to take it is how it will be taken. Excellent. Thanks. All right. Should we start with that one? And then since uh, you brought it up and then we'll just um, go to the top or after that, or should we start at the top and give people uh, some time to answer that by the time we get to it? Let's start at the top and get to that one. All right, so how do I turn my hands on application activities into virtual sessions? Um, and I'm thinking here, uh, I'm I'm not sure exactly what the hands on group work would be, but I'm imagining that's um, me. OK, go ahead, Courtney. Um, so I do a lot of problem based learning and it quickly dawned on me how much material I actually provide them for their hands on like paper product to be able to okay here's the material that you need for step one read through discuss as a group now that you're done with that first step here's the second part um and just realizing that i'm actually providing them quite a bit of hands-on material um i did actually come to the resolution that in order to complete some of the activities that we do. Um, I created a packet for every student to pick up um, on campus so that they would have the hand. They really seem to enjoy it um, and have this like individual package for them from me. Um, but I guess that I'm just constantly reflecting and not and I know I was going to say I thought maybe that what the, I noted who made the comment before that they kind of had to start over you know and reinvent those activities uh, but there I'm sure as we all know a variety of reasons where some of mine align with certification and governing boards and licensure and they are things that I just don't I mean I could try to find another way but I also look at equity and what my other students were experiencing in this class and will I be changing the quality of the experience of the student by basically degrading these really rich ex experiences and assignments that they've done together by replacing them with a digital version. So um, I guess I'm just always open to ideas in what people have done to mitigate the hurdle of taking rich learning experiences in a group to a virtual platform. The, the, the kinesthetics of of the, the, the tangible and the things that we grab, I see a lot of participants in our list who work in disciplines that are very hands on and I'd love to hear some other folks' ideas on how they're dealing with this. Um, I don't know. I want to call it a new reality, but let's let's call it uh, hopefully a an intermission of of uh, a break or or shift um, in some ways that may or may not be permanent. Um, but it's certainly getting us all to rethink. Like, how do we, you know, can the digital tools uh, replace, or are they best as supplemental tools? Anyone else have thoughts? 
I know that one of my thoughts is um, having giving the students again the power to um, take charge of their own learning is in some ways better than us trying to anticipate and predict that well this would work for me so let's force it on them and I'm thinking for example I can create a group space in Canvas where they can add their material collaborate in discussions it would be a formal um, blessed by the university space for them to store stuff but I would tend to say hey students if you find that you want to work together and meet uh, Google meet or if TikTok, you know, whatever the du jour thing that students use um, as a group and you all agree on that and you all think that, oh yeah, I'm very used to using Discord, for example, why would I want to try to meet through Blackboard Collaborate or Microsoft Teams? Um, so letting them have that power to choose, mm -hmm. I think goes away, uh, a, a long way towards um, engaging them in, in some of the problem solving um, in ways that meet their needs more than we can anticipate. That doesn't fully directly answer your question, but no, it's that's okay. It may, I was thinking of two things, I guess, just going back to the idea that I'm providing them um, material that they only need for their activity together, right? They don't need it for a quiz. They don't. And John, the last, um, the last active teaching lab that I attended on the course in a half syndrome, you know, my biggest concern was also visual overwhelm of the amount of material that's up yeah. there um, for them to see. So I guess that's it's like my catch 22 where sure I can put these, you know, here's the next handout for the activity or here's the material that you need specific to work your way through this problem based learning. But then they've also just got so much and it looks like a course and a half syndrome, right? Yeah. Um, and I do, I love the idea of allowing them to use a platform as, as long as they agree upon as a group that it works well for all of them. It's a bit of a moot point for me because all of my group work occurs during class, which for me, again, eliminates a lot of the dislike of having to schedule and nobody available right. until 8 right. p.m. and all of that. Right. Beautiful. Courtney, I wanted to just follow through again on what you just mentioned about, um, and I think that's it. I don't see it on our um, activity sheet, but I think what you just mentioned is a huge point, which is when is the activity going to occur? And um, as I was, when John and I were bantering back and forth about whether course related group work is like the real world, um, you know, I was saying in my, my, position, 40% of my salary is not dependent on three other people's progress, you know, um, we we're talking about. And moreover, I do get asked this a lot, but that's because I think faculty hours are very fluid, but I think most um, academic staff are not asked, okay, we want you to do this and you're going to have to find time outside of your work hours, you know, 10 hours a week to do this project. And so we need to think about our students and when we're asking them to find time. And I think there's value in both, in both the group work that's done during a synchronous class schedule and the group work that's done outside a synchronous class schedule. I would just encourage us when we do assign the group work that's done outside a synchronous class schedule to account back to this course and a half bit to say, this is going to take an hour for doing X, an hour for doing Y, an hour for doing Z, and you know, and account for that when we're taught when we are designing our courses unit by unit and day by day. Um, because yeah, that absolutely. is when I, I often tell my PhD students the hardest part of proposing your dissertation is finding a time that five people can get together. And, yes. but, <laughs> and, well, and I was just gonna point out a thesis <laughs> note. That yeah. getting your group, getting your committee together is one of the hardest steps. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say with the idea of purposeful grouping, um, I just think that I'd rec like completely support what you say and recommend that if you are going to require students to work outside of the class period, consider grouping them based on their outside of class availability. And there are a number of ways that you can do that so easily now, like with the when to meet. And it would it's very easy for them to fill out when they have available time. Um, and they find that 
you know, very, they feel very supported when you, it's a considerate thing to do for them. And just That's to underscore, wonderful. to pick back up what Peter had said about truth in advertising, um, you know, on my syllabus, I say that you will need to find one hour a week to do da da da. And I make sure that students know that. And it's part of their contract that they know that coming in because I don't want students to be struggling to say, I can't do that. That's my, you know, I mean, I've had students who are, um, uh, in Afghanistan, literally in Afghanistan, in the military, I've had students who um, their children are in the hospital and the list goes on. And so I want them to know, I want them to, to be as aware as possible of what they're going to be required to do. Great. All right. Uh, the next one is how well do the groups function work? And I see answers there from Morton and um, I see some is that from Paul and Heidi. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, folks who have better experience than I do um, using the groups function um, to talk about how they use that and how they how their students use that uh, to be effective um, for group work. So uh, feel free to speak up anyone who has used that. I'll jump in, but someone should interrupt me. I have used uh, Canvas groups. In fact, that's the sole reason I wanted us to have Canvas on this campus because I had um, worked with other colleagues on other campuses who were already using Canvas. I thought it was Canvas. a speed grader that you love. Oh, well, speed grader, you're right. That's worth it. That is completely worth it. But groups, and um, now it's, you know, with this newest um, change to the um, rich text editor. Um, it's easier for students to embed images and the like. But the re one of the main reasons that I love groups, and if I was teaching even just 12 students, I'd stick them all in one group, is that they get access to, by put it, being in a group, they get access to most all the features that we as instructors get. They get to upload directly images, as John mentioned. They get to upload <clears throat> directly files. They can share files together. They can um, they go can go directly from Canvas groups to um, a shared Google Drive because they are in a Canvas group. Um, the, the list goes on and they, there are other bells and whistles I, that I haven't even explored. But by putting the students in groups, um, they get as a, a ton of the features, the Canvas features for file management, file sharing and the like that um, they don't in the regular. And someone else mentioned that the groups go direct, can are very fluid from Canvas to Zoom. And I haven't explored that, but um, someone else mentioned it in the activity sheet. Yeah, I remember that. Um, that was, a, I, I labeled it a hot tip. Um, but yeah, for some reason, the default student access permissions is really low. So. Um, I was I was going to say I know an instructor and I, I'm thinking now that it might have been you who created discussions and said, OK, we're going to have even if it's a small class, one discussion, 12 students, <laughs> you're all part of this group. You know, even having them in the group instead of just as students in that discussion, they have better access to do more of the things yeah. that they do in other apps that they can't do in Canvas discussions right. as a Generic Definitely speed. the files upload. Like as soon as you get into your group, you've got a menu on the left that allows you to um, put your material in there, your 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 groups, files, materials in there. So that's a nice feature. All right, and we've got another um, option for uh, giving folks a, a Google Drive, and I love that too as a, a a big Google advocate because the flexibility of Google and recognizing that a lot of our students come from K twelve. Google schools, so they're already familiar. That's one more sort of lowering of the barrier. They don't have to learn how to do this in Canvas. They can do the thing that they've been doing for the last 12 years or however long Google schools have been Google schools. Um, and so the familiarity is there. Another good reason to listen to the students, um, they can tell you, hey, we've been doing this other thing for however many years. Um, maybe there are things that they can teach you. Give them a chance, ask them some questions. Angela, go ahead. Angela, um, Hello, unmute. Sorry. There you are. Too many, too many buttons. Um, yeah, um, I think just as a slight alternate perspective, because I put in that Google Drive folders are something I found really useful. Um, I don't know, from the, 
I think there's a lot of cool tools that the Canvas groups have for students. I think for me on the instructor side of things, when I've tried to use it, I just found it like so clunky in the sense that like there's many buttons you have to press to to get into places. And so I don't I'm not trying to like scare people off or anything, but <laughs> I guess as an alternate, you know, if there is something that works for me, I thought um, using a Google Drive. So all the information is on Canvas for students and then they just kind of do their work in this other space because I was trying to like decrease the number of clicks they have to do. Um, so I think if you are using group, Google Groups or whatever platform as much as possible, trying to decrease the clicks so that they know exactly where they can get to um, is super helpful uh, in general. <laughs> so that was just a little plug, but I think Canvas Groups has a lot, and I think I need to like check back in every so often because they make changes and then I'm like, oh, now it's functional for me, but yeah, just less clicks for the win, that's all. And that's the thing that, um is the um a big difference between sort of the canvas wiki pages where you can set up a page so that multiple students can edit it um and contribute to it but that is not a, a synchronous editing the way that a google document is um if you have several people working on a canvas page together it's whoever saves first their work mm -hmm. is saved and other people's work is lost so that can be very frustrating um for that so yeah, Google Docs within a Canvas group um, where you work on an embedded document, mm -hmm. for example, but just use the Canvas so that you as an instructor can see what's going on um, sure. and so that they can they have an official place to to, to get to is, is I think a good idea. Name yeah. tag, Mr. Link, oh, sorry. There all, I was just going to say, is there already a, a quick tips on how to embed that right within your canvas can we go to a canvas support page that'll just tell us how to do that there For is groups? and i will yeah. find yeah just just uh, while john's doing that i'll just dovetail since john brought up how much i love speed grader if you do use canvas groups and those groups use the canvas groups files those files anything that a student puts into those files is accessible to speed grader. So in terms of cutting down the number of clicks, then as an instructor, I don't have to go over and find that group's work in a Google, in a group, a Google Drive. I have it accessible through um, speed grader because they're using that. But I totally, totally get that we want to cut down the number of clicks for everyone, not just instructors. All right, and I put into chat and I'm going to put it in here as well um, that the em embedding options and I'm going to give a, a, a shout out to Tom Bryan for helping me figure out a lot of this um, ways to embed into Canvas Google stuff. Um, right here in this uh, in this uh, previous active teaching lab uh, work activity sheet. All right, let's uh, head on to managing bandwidth. Here we are, JT. Um, variables and and other things. So I'm guessing that if, if one has synchronous group work, so live video group work and the groups meet individually, um, some of those students may have um, better bandwidth than other students, right? Some students may have to share a computer and the internet with uh, a sibling um, who's also working at home or there's only one computer and the parents are using it for working at home. So the negotiations of scheduling is really uh, critical there. Um, how much bandwidth, you know, will people be popping in and out? Um, I don't know what the lowest uh, common denominator is for doing good group work on a, a computer, but I will tell you that asynchronous Google Sheets, or I'm uh, sorry, Google Docs is, uh, is, a, is again, a, a pretty good one because it's very low bandwidth. You can do it on your phone. It's not great, but you can do it on your phone. It's, it's better than a lot of other editing of documents on phones. Um, and you can do it at, at multiple times. You don't always have to be there together. It has the built-in chat feature. It's got the comment feature. It's got commenting and editing, and uh, it's a very good collaborative tool. And it's sort of a low bar. Again, a lot of our students are already familiar with it. Um, but that's just one idea. Other people have thoughts? I was going to say, Morton, what I really appreciated with you um, describing your course as a, as, a, as a component of your course was the importance of a contract. And students are aware of the expectations 
prior. So there sort of makes that logistical um, uh, logistical elements a little bit clearer at the outset. So they can manage their bandwidth. They can identify some um, obstacles that they personally might have. So that's a great way to for me to think about that. So thank you. Oh, unmute yourself, Martin. Thanks. Maybe I thank you for that feedback. I really appreciate it. And I was going to say, um, maybe because I've been teaching by choice online even before the pandemic, um, I really wanted students to know what they were getting into because there's a lot of misconceptions. And I was going to mention some uh, other thing that I do that other, and, and I've even done an active lab on this before with demos. And uh, this is just an option. I don't, I'm not recommending that everyone has to incorporate it. Um, uh, when I have my groups of nine, then I divide them into uh, groups of three students and they are responsible for synchronous chatting with one another um, once during every 10 of the 14 units. And I always give them the option to, they could do it by Zoom, they could do it by any other video chat. The vast majority prefer to do text-based chat. And so text-based chat, as John was saying, is also low bandwidth. And um, I don't know if students are choosing the text-based chat because whatever reason they want to stay in their jammies, they, you know, whatever the reason is. Um, and, um, but they also have to save their transcript and submit that. And that's another way that I, I hope to kind of keep the, the quality high, but students tend to prefer to do the text-based chat over video or audio chat. I was just trying to look up that um, activity sheet, but that was, uh, it'll take me just a little bit to, to find it. Excellent. All right, let's, uh, let's get going on this. We've only got a few more minutes. Ensuring practices and student project groups transfer into the workplace. Okay. Um, Again, this is a thing that Morton and I were having a discussion, a lively discussion about beforehand. Um, as she said, it's not the same, right? And there's a whole uh, part of the activity sheet on the uh, on the next page, I think, that talks about the differences, you know, some of the differences, and there's a table that you can add to. Now, this is not to say that there, are, it's group work is more like work group work than individual work is, right? So there are elements that you can focus on um, and make the same, make similar, but figure out ways and ask your students again, how to figure out ways to make those interactions low stakes or no stakes so that they don't have to depend on the other members of the group knowing all of the answers and knowing how to do all of this. Um, I, I guess that's the, that's the quick answer. Um, we have any thoughts from other folks on this? I think it depends on what um, what you're whether it transfers from uh, school to real life group work at school. I mean, it depends what you're doing. It's like in my profession, that's all you do is group work, right? <laughs> like that's literally my job in this collaborative form. And folks I know who work in consulting, for example, they're like literally it's just group work all the time. So I think it just depends on the field. Yeah. Well, I think. Sorry, make sure I'm not muted. I, I don't doubt that that's the case. And I think that um, in many fields, we work with other people. But is working with other people the same as um, the way that many times group work is structured in the classroom in the sense that who, who gets together as the group usually? For example, let's take a consultant or, or let's just take my own life. So I collaborate in, in my research a lot. I usually choose my collaborators. I usually choose my collaborators because I know that they have a skill that I might not have. I usually, and the list goes on, and that t tends to be a little bit different from a more standard group work activity in a classroom where the instructor says, okay, these, this, here's group A, B, and C, right. and they're not necessarily chosen because they have these complementary skills. 
Um, they're not necessarily chosen because um, I know that there's some approaches to group work where we say you're going to be the leader and you're going to be the this and you're going to be the that. Um, and that I think better parallels the real world. But I think yeah. the constellation. Oh, I didn't say. I think the constellation of the group is it tends to be a little different than classic group work. I also think the outcome that if your job is blah, blah, blah. But most students don't see their job as being a consultant. Most people, students see their job as no, I understand choir master. You know, my discipline is theater. So literally my job is being put with groups of people all the time and having to make it work. And I think that's why, on, yes. yeah, I think that's why purposeful groups becomes really important. You know, I put my students together based on interests, right? Which is sort of how you end up doing a play. I, I just think there are a lot of parallels. I understand what you're saying about the stakes for the individual versus the group, but I do most of my grading based on process or most of my evaluation based on process rather than product. So um, I just think there are a lot of comparisons to real world I, situations. I think absolutely. I think that, I mean, I was I, I'm kissing and telling, I was in a group meeting yesterday that I left thinking this is going to be like all the group work that I had to do in college. I'm going to end up doing 90% of it because I could tell that people, so I think there's parallels. I absolutely, yeah. John and I said that we know that um, we get, I mean, what my big thing is to not allow students to get hamstrung by other, other students <laughs> nice. inability. Yeah. That's my life. I'm, I'm hamstrung every day of my life by other people. But, and, and so it's really good for us to learn that. And I think there are parallels, but I do think there's that if we want to use group work as a model to teach students real work life, mm -hmm. we need to make those groups as much like, and it sounds like you're doing exactly that by having- Well, I think it's also just about being explicit. Like I have a day in class where I ask them what their major is or what they want to do in life. And then I explain to them how writing a paper with a thesis will help them, right? I think you need to be really explicit about, we're not just doing these things because I can't think of anything yeah. better for you to do. They actually have practical applications and wherever you're sure. going. That's all, I just wanted to jump in and say sure. that. Sure, there is this one really cute study that um, about group work where at the beginning the semester, the instructors ask students just simply, you know, based on your past experience, do you like working in groups or do you not like working in groups? And then they put the people who like working in groups together and the people who don't like yeah. working in groups together. And that seems to be more successful than what you might think, which is let's dose each group with someone who likes it and someone who doesn't. <laughs> All right. Thank you. We only have two minutes left, and this is a conversation that I I can see we could go on for hours on this, but we only have two minutes. I want to invite anybody to jump in with something that they urgently want addressed in the last two or three minutes. Um, otherwise, I want to direct you all to the rest of the um, information on the activity sheet. Angela, I see your name. I see your fingers going up. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say there's a question in there about sharing out at the end of the semester. Um, and I was going to share that I, I did. Um, I had students record video presentations as a pair using BBC Ultra, which sounds unconventional, but they can both log in and one. I give them very a bunch of instructions like one person's going to be your slide, you know, and how to like time it and, you know, make sure you've got a, a script you can follow along because they're making a video rather than a live presentation and then have instructors or facilitators in smaller groups play each video and then have students in the room that watch the video together and then they can ask the speakers questions. So that worked really well. It was super fun. I got the idea from a conference I went to. So it was nice to have the pre-recorded video and then you can play it. Uh, and then another idea in terms of sharing group works, I haven't done this one yet, but I like the idea is having like poster session rooms. So like BBC Ultra, you can create persistent rooms. You could probably do it in Zoom too, but Ultra is just like easier to navigate sometimes through Canvas. Um, but yeah, you could have students and you could even invite, you know, faculty or other people to stop in each room and maybe the students can pull up a digital uh, poster and kind of walk people through it. So if you want to have a live uh, session, I think there's ways to do that. And, and even using something as simple as Google Slides, again, a collaborative slide where every group gets a single slide to report back out onto. They all see each other's slides. Um, they can ask questions. They can comment on, on it on the side and ask those text-based asynchronous questions as well as the presentation that you're talking about. Um, all right, it's two o'clock. I wanna thank you all for 
dealing with my fumbling at the very beginning of this. I'm hoping to get this all figured out and um, thank you, Courtney, for jumping into that other room and helping me recognize that there are people going in the wrong places. I've got a. This is harder than I thought. This is harder than Blackboard Collaborate was last semester. Um, so thanks all for putting up with the patience, uh, being patient and putting up with that and playing along. Next week we're going to talk about using media, um, so I invite you to come back next week. We also are following up these chats, I'm sorry, these labs with a chat tomorrow from 1 to 2. So I will be here from 1 to 2 tomorrow. I'll make sure that the right link is in that team space. I'm hoping that it, the right link is in the email that I sent out today um, or this week. I, many of you got here, so I think that it is, um, but I'll be there tomorrow and we'll help you figure out how to apply some of this directly into your teaching and learning context and learning environments. Thank you again, um, Martin, for helping me um, work through this activity sheet and structuring that. And um, thank you all for your conversations. Have a good afternoon. And I will stick around if anyone wants to um, stick around for the next couple of minutes. Um, I will be around just to just to say hi. And Paul, if you want to talk about using Zoom versus Teams, I'm I 